I am Prof uh, Associate Professor Lee Pinkowitz. I am Associate Professor of Finance here at uh, McDonough School of Business at Georgetown and also uh, the Associate Director of Student Engagement at the Center for Financial Markets. Uh, I am really pleased to be, uh, I guess, moderating this panel on the future of digital assets and uh, want to introduce our panelists very briefly. I will give them a, a chance for you know, 60 seconds, 90 seconds to introduce themselves afterwards. Uh, we have uh, Dan Gallagher from Robinhood. We have Sarah Olson from JP Morgan and Jaime Werke from FINRA. Uh, Dan, if you wanted to kind of provide a, a brief self-introduction, you're on. Sure. Thanks, Professor. Uh, Dan Gallagher. I'm the, currently the Chief Legal Officer at um, Robinhood. I'm on the board of Symbian, relevant for today's discussion, um, on the board of the National Association of Corporate Directors and an advisor to um, Rally Road. Uh, before all this, I was at the SEC for a long time, where I actually worked with my co-panelist here, Jaime, uh, for years, um, and so happy to be re United with him on the panel and uh, excited to be here. Uh, well, I guess, Jaime, since you got the shout out, why don't you go next? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'd love to. Uh, so I'm Jaime Werke. I head up uh, Finner's Office of Financial Innovation, and our group was really created about three years ago to kind of serve as a facil facilitator for innovation in the securities market in a manner that's consistent with our overall mission, which is investor protection and market integrity. And Sarah? Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Olson. I lead corporate development for Onyx by JP Morgan. Um, Onyx is a group within JP, within our investment bank at JP Morgan focused on blockchain technology. Uh, we build out solutions ourselves. Um, however, I predominantly focus on investing in blockchain infrastructure companies and looking for you know, external companies in the space to partner with to meet the needs of our clients. Um, I'm a little bit of a weird hire for a bank. Um, prior to this, I joined from a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, I worked for Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss, where I led corporate development for Gemini. Um, that was a pretty interesting seat um, where we launched the first uh, regulated crypto derivative. We launched the first regulated stablecoin. Um, we acquired an NFT platform several years ago, kind of ahead of the sort of the NFT space. Um, so it's been interesting being kind of a crypto person, you know, joining a bank and, and, and looking at digital assets from that perspective now. Um, but the most important part about my background is I am a very proud boya. Um, so I graduated from college in 2009. Uh, and Dan also is a proud Hoya, I assume, right? I, uh, I'm, I'm at least attributing pride, pride to you. How about that? <laughs> very, very prideful. Very okay, prideful. fantastic. Uh, you know, Sarah, actually, with that introduction, maybe the first thing that, that you know, would be helpful here, and, and uh, Jaime, I'll, I'll send this to you, which is sort of what is the difference between digital assets and, and sort of blockchain, right? And, and what are the different types of digital assets, you know, as, as a way to sort of kick this off? Any thoughts? Sure. So t maybe to draw an analogy to, uh, to an area people are more familiar with, um, if you think about it in terms of like an operating system um, that, that may exist, uh, where there be uh, one by Google, or maybe, maybe by Microsoft, and you think about the apps that are on those various operating systems, um, it, blockchain is really kind of the, the operating system itself. It's the platform under which you operate. Um, and the digital assets are, are an app or basically a function that exists on the blockchain. So really a digital asset is, is a record of a real or virtual asset, one that's native to the blockchain um, um, on the blockchain. So it's basically just a record that sits on the blockchain. Um, but it's important to draw that distinction because people are kind of uh, associate things, you know, like Bitcoin being the blockchain, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's basically, it, it's, it's a record of an asset on, on the blockchain. And then talking and, about different sorry. types of digital assets, yeah. there's a lot of different ways you can slice that. You know, there, there's the one I just mentioned, which is, is if something's native to the blockchain, um, meaning that it only exists virtually on the blockchain, or if it's a tokenized asset, meaning it's a physical asset or, or some other type of assets that exists elsewhere and is represented um, on the blockchain. Um, there's looking at different types of digital assets, for example, NFTs um, or, uh, you know, things are uh, viewed more as commodities, things like Ether. Um, from my vantage point, sitting at a securities regulator, really the, the, the distinction that we draw primarily is, is a digital asset a security or not? Um, and if it is a security, there's a certain set of rules and requirements that apply. And if it's not, there's other 
Sarah, you had mentioned, you know, you're sort of a weird hire from the bank in the sense that you could have came from a crypto exchange. And so, you know, we're seeing this uh, connection between digital, or I guess collision between digital assets and, and real assets. Uh, if you wanted to kind of talk about either your experiences there or, or build on what Jaime mentioned, I thought you might have an interesting perspective. Sure. I think I think what we're really beginning to see from a high level is this sort of sort of bifurcation and then uh, kind of what I consider to be you know public blockchain infrastructure versus private public uh, private blockchain infrastructure. And so when when folks talk about public blockchain infrastructure, really what they're talking about are these permissionless systems that anyone can interact with. And so Bitcoin is what you consider to be public blockchain infrastructure. Same with Ethereum. Um, what's cool about it is you only need access to the internet to be able to participate in these economies. Um, and that's everything from being able to transfer value to you know, adding upgrades to these operating systems to be paid from these networks for maintaining them through things like mining and staking. And that's kind of phenomenal because now we have this sort of, you know, that we have this sort of global permissionless network that anybody can take part in, and including, you know, tra tra uh, transferring value, um, you know, as an application that, that Jaime mentioned. Um, but that's also really problematic, right? I mean, we're, we're on the phone with regulators and, and lawyers right now. Um, and we have a, you know, and our financial activities in this country and globally are, are, are highly regulated. You know, so the question is, you know, what's the appropriate intersection between, you know, kind of crypto or public blockchain and, you know, public blockchain and then leveraging this technology to create, you know, kind of highly permission systems. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, the question is, you know, are we going to have an internet or, or lots of internet? I think it'll be the former, you know, and I think that banks will need to figure out kind of how to best intersect with these public networks. Um, but right now it's very, very complex. And so you see almost this friction between, you know, do we create sort of our own permission blockchain in which we're only selecting the participants? Or, you know, do we think more creatively about how we can, you know, leverage this public infrastructure to, you know, to, to best use, you know, these, these new types of applications? Um, so, so I, I would say from like a, the highest level, that's that's kind of the, the the friction that I'm seeing right now between kind of crypto and institutions. Okay, uh, Dan, the, 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 uh, Sarah mentioned uh, being on the phone with regulators and lawyers, of which you were uh, sort of both, <laughs> and then now we're on the other side. Um, what is your kind of view on this either? You know what Sarah has mentioned in terms of where this is heading, um, uh, and maybe the different hat you wear than you did as a regulator. Sure. Well, I think Sarah was spot on, and I think um, you know the additional friction that, that she was getting at, I would say, is coming from the the unregulated world, right? So from some of the the platforms that don't have any regulated entities, either banking, brokerage, or other, who are really accelerating their growth, accelerating product offering and bringing more challenge to the traditional players. And I would say at Robinhood, we, we are, strangely enough, uh, despite the fact we're a big disruptor, we've changed brokerage, uh, I would say, rather completely on the self-directed side. Uh, but we're part of the traditional system in the sense that we have regulated brokers. Jaime is one of my regulators. Uh, you know, FINRA lives with us, the SEC, we have state regulators, um, and so on. And so when you're a regulated entity trying to adapt to this new reality that Sarah was talking about, it makes it even more complicated. You can't just rush into whatever makes the most sense. You have to take on board what your current regulators might think of this new technology. Uh, in this current environment, it's a lot of uncertainty, right? You have Chair Gensler at the SEC. It seems like uh, in every speech or media appearance makes some reference uh, to crypto or digital assets more generally. Um, you know, sometimes throws cold water on it. Sometimes uh, there's a glimmer of sunlight and, you know, without a real regulatory process, uh, a, a real rulemaking out of the SEC, legislation coming out of Congress and don't hold your breath there. Uh, it's kind of like shadow boxing. And, you know, you, you get in, if you're Robin Hood, you have, you know, we have 22 and a half million active customers. They're very interested in crypto. We have a very limited offering and they want more and more uh, product and but you have to be very careful and deliberate. We, you know, we said this in our last earnings call that you can't just be tacking on new coins if the next day, you know, by some by some fiat, a regulator is going to call them a security. So uh, it's a very tense situation in that regard, and it does call for regulatory 
clarity, clarity, which we haven't seen yet. And just one more piece, not to go on too long, but I think some, some amount of time and maybe even four years worth of time, I think was lost to fraud in the market. And, you know, very close with Jay Clayton. I think he was a terrific chairman of the SEC. He, when he walked in, whatever his views of crypto or digital assets are, and I know he has very, very positive views of the infrastructure, DLT and blockchain, uh, they, they changed the minute he walked in because he was dealing with overwhelming fraud in the ICO market and no one's going to debate, right? There was just massive fraud and he had to deal with fraud and to deal with fraud, you use your enforcement program. And when you use your enforcement program, sometimes you create uh, bad policy on the edges. Um, but putting that aside, there wasn't a real, you know, sober time to sit, study it and come out with a regulatory paradigm that works. So we lost time due to that fraud. Well, yeah, Dan, if I let, could just add to it, go ahead, I mean, what Dan yeah, was saying, you know, um, I think it's probably important to start off with the understanding kind of what the, the regulatory landscape is for digital assets right now, right? So you have, um, if a product is a digital assets and it qualifies as security, there's, as I was mentioned before, there's a specific set of rules under the federal securities laws, similar to other securities that would apply in that context. If it's not a security, um, it, it, it potentially falls into being a commodity. Um, and the spot market for commodities, meaning that not futures or derivatives commodities, that, that market has um, limited federal uh, oversight. Um, the CFTC does have some enforcement powers there, but uh, there's no federal functional regulator there. So there, there is this um, desire to potentially fall within that bracket so that that oversight is, is potentially not as robust as, as it otherwise would be. I think... When people talk about kind of, you know, the, the fragmentation of the digital assets regulation, it's important to understand that there is that, there's that area where there isn't as much regulatory action going on. Now, if you're looking at the futures for, the, uh, for, for things like Bitcoins or Ether or things like that, that would be regulated by the CFTC, but the spot market doesn't have as much regulation there. Um, there is some state regulation that applies in that context. Um, and I think this is where kind of some of the the, the concerns are about, you know, where um, investors or even for the marketplace itself, if there isn't a framework around how it's supposed to operate, um, it, it, it potentially doesn't uh, enable the building of enough confidence within the system or potentially opens the door for other things that, as Dan was describing, fraud or other things to, to get carried out. I do want to challenge the, the regulatory framework a little bit, and it is complicated in the U.S. where we have this bifurcated system where we have securities that are regulated by, you know, um, one body and, and, and commodity commodities and predominantly commodity derivatives by another. But, but the issue with crypto is, you know, we've seen a lot of projects that can start off, you know, that kind of look and feel like a security. And then as they become sort of more decentralized networks and you have more applications that are running on them, that it then begin to feel like, a, you know, a commodity. And so we, you know, it's almost like Sorority's paradox. It's sort of what point, you know, is this so centralized that this feels like a security where you're essentially just buying equity in a, you know, a, a company, you know, maybe run by whatever five people out of Silicon Valley, you know, and at one point, do we have this kind of um, uh, autonomous operating system where you're really buying a commodity in order to use that. And I think that it's very difficult for early projects that need to be able to, um, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily from like a capital raising standpoint, but really from, you know, a, a, having having um, other projects use their protocol to write new applications and having those incentives be correct, it creates a really complicated economic structure. So again, you can have something that like at one point looks like a security and then everything kind of goes right. And then six months later, it looks like a commodity. And the question is, you know, it, it, is that okay? You know, and, 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 and how is that transition regulated? Given that, and what, what the three of you just sort of discussed, and I, I recognize we're not going to create a regulatory regime on this call, but uh, Dan, <laughs> Dan, what, like, if you um, were trying to say, well, like, what would be the ideal regulatory path, at least in your view, um, that the U.S. should undertake to, I guess, to, to sort of uh, be successful and yet control aspects of fraud and protect investors? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I, you know, instead of talking about what would be ideal, I guess I think, you know, take a chapter out of the history book and say what would not be ideal. And 
you know, what, what did we see after the financial crisis, right? In Title VII of Dodd-Frank, you had the derivatives market, right? A lot of blame was placed on the derivatives market, some rightfully, some not, uh, for the financial crisis in 08. What you got out of Title VII of Dodd-Frank was this intensely prescriptive framework for regulating derivatives, right? Formerly OTC derivatives will now be exchange traded. Uh, to, to Sarah's point, you know, you have uh, shared jurisdiction over those very derivatives between the CFTC and the SEC. You have two regulatory regimes set up for it. And when you look at it, it's a lot like existing futures market infrastructure on the CFTC side and equities market structure on the SEC side. So you, you took what regulators do and what policymakers do is they take something they think works and they overlay it in a new market. And coming at crypto, uh, coming at digital assets, digital securities with this like better mousetrap design of let's just overlay the equities markets onto it. Let's overlay existing structures. I don't think will work. It, you know, I think you're trying to replicate a lot of the inefficiencies that exist in those very markets. I mean, the, the equities markets are, you know, when, whenever you're an SEC commissioner or a former one, you have to say they're the deepest in the world and our capital markets are the envy of the world. You've heard that a million times. And they are, despite massive inefficiencies built into them and opacity and, and other things, uh, no one would, if they had a clean slate, build our U.S. equity market structure the way it exists today. So let's not overlay that into digital securities. Let's recognize the efficiencies that come with this new technology. So my caution to regulators, policymakers there is resist the temptation to try to overlay what you know and be creative, work with the industry, right? Work with the folks who are using this technology to great effect today, with great efficiency today, to come up with something lighter touch, but that to your point, Professor, gets at the fraud issues, gets at the core investor protection issues, you can do that without regulating in a very prescriptive way. Uh, so Sarah, you, you were sort of talking about it's a bit of an odd ecosystem in terms of this. So if, if you, and I mean, this is not lobbying or anything, but if, if you had suggestions, what, what would, you know, what should be the direction, right? So light touch, sure, but what, what is there a direction we should be thinking? Yeah, like, like these are the types of questions that get you fired at a bank when you're not like a... <laughs> <laughs> when you're not like a lawyer or a regulator, so I've got to be, I've got to be careful. But I, 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 I echo what, what Dan was saying, where I, I think that we, that we have to be really creative, and we have to create, um, you know, we have to create policy that makes sense for the technology. Um, and you know, and so looking at, you know, we, we the. the the, the crypto industry, you know, has all these sort of idiosyncratic problems and it has, you know, and that's a lot of bad stuff going on right now, right? Like, I mean, we have fraud, you know, we had ICO fraud, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of fraud in the NFT markets right now, unfortunately. Um, I think that we're seeing, um, even just from the, the technical design of, uh, of smart contract platforms like Ethereum, we see almost built in market, market manipulation um, through being able to front run trades on DEXs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the concept of flash loans, which, you know, again, is, is a weird um, sort of a, a weird exploit of a smart contract that doesn't exist in the, in the um, kind of analog traditional world. So, you know, just to, just to name a few. And, um, and again, the, these do need to be regulated. I mean, people need to be protected from, from these types of activities. Uh, but it needs to be, again, it, it needs to be in parallel with the technology. So we can't look at what we did sort of 50 years ago for something that kind of looks kind of looks like this, you know, we have to really kind of better understand the technology and says, you know, kind of what is, what is the goal of this technology and how can this technology, you know, hurt users and, and, and what's the best, you know, regulation. Um, and then also when's the time to like kind of, I don't want to say not regulate, but you know, what are appropriate sandboxes for people to experiment in? Um, and then as they evolve, get to a place where they have more consumer protections. Uh, Jaime, there's a chat. There's, I, and I want to get your take on this too, but I, I also want to. Try, Kirsten uh, in the in the Q and A is asked, "Do you see the path forward being using the existing regulatory structure?" Now she's mentioning SEC and, and CFTC, right? I'm just thinking, in your from your seat in Finra, what is your view on this? Is is Kirsten's path or the suggestion? May not say just the question is, is that existing infrastructure going to work, or do we need to think something else? So. Um... Maybe I'll just echo part of what uh, Sarah and Dan both said, which is that 
we do need some form of, of regulation for the parts of the market that are potentially uh, not subject to a full plan and play of regulation. So, right. So, for example, uh, the president's working group recently came out with um, uh, with a report on stable coins, and it had some recommendations around there about potential legislation, and other types of actions that, that can take place. Um, I would note that similar to the analogy that Dan drew about kind of the, the swaps market um, and, um, you know, kind of the, the development of legislation around swaps after the financial crisis, you do have a segment of the, the digital assets world, uh, specifically the spot market for the commodities that's not subject to full panoply, at least federal regulation, right? So there is that, that is the space where things like that can more than, are more susceptible to happening, right? So, and I think it's important to at least first acknowledge that. And then once you acknowledge that, then talk about, well, what is the best way to bring that under the regulatory umbrella? Where there, you know, it's it's laying over the existing regulatory structures, which I think both Dan and Sarah agree, it's probably not the way to go, uh, but, but what is the appropriate way to go? Um, and how do you go about thinking about measuring what risks are in the system uh, with the potential benefits that can be accrued. Um, and making sure that you're also creating a level playing field so that you know traditional financial system as opposed to the, the, the digital asset DeFi world are operating in a way that you're not having regulatory arbitrage between one and the other. So I, I just, I guess to push a little bit of this and, and make sure I get Kirsten's question um, precise because the back part of it is, you know, is it possible, should we be creating, or should we be thinking about creating a new regulator for crypto, right? Uh, it, it, or does that just broaden the scope of potential regulatory arbitrage here? Yeah, um, I, I would probably say that's probably beyond my pay grade, but I would <laughs> note, <laughs> I would note that what we as regulators are trying to do now is given the current authority that we have, um, trying to figure out the best way to go about uh, uh, kind of having regulation over that. And for example, specifically within the security space, within, within digital assets that are security, right? Um, and, you know, everything may not always be perfect, but I think what we're trying to do is take a measured approach um, where we are trying to um, leave room for operation of that market, but still, um, uh, still have a way that, that the investors, the underlying investors are protected. And as, you know, as I was pointing out earlier, <clears throat> you had a number of ICOs that, that were issued, uh, a number of them with fraud that, was, that were interwoven with them. They were being issued similar in the same way that you'd raise capital in a securities offering without kind of having the mask of having a technology that, that didn't take into effect what you're actually doing from an economic standpoint. So, um, and, and and I think there's a realization, there's, there's a need to fight against that. But I think there's also a realization, at least, you know, um, uh, on a lot of regulators' part that um, want to leave a room for this market to have the benefits that it could potentially apply to investors and others as well. So, uh, Jaime, uh, sorry, Jaime mentioned um, DeFi. Sarah, it, you know, certainly this is a buzzword and The Economist is talking about it. And um, we often, or maybe we often, so often think about it as, oh, well, this is going to disintermediate financial institutions, right? Is So what is DeFi and how are like conventional bankings, have banks kind of a, uh, embracing it or, or not? Sure. So it, it DeFi stands for decentralized finance. So you'll hear crypto folks talking about DeFi versus TradFi for as in for traditional finance. Um, and DeFi can encompass like a lot of different activities that you can have with kind of with value exchange on a blockchain. But you know, from the sort of most simple kind of perspective, um, you know, when when Bitcoin was launched um, in early 2009, you know, the technology was pretty phenomenal from having a decentralized, um, you know, a decentralized ledger where you could transfer value to, you know, anyone all over the world, you know, just provided that they had, you know, access to the internet. But that's kind of all you could do. You know, you, know, you could sort of send, you could send Bitcoin to someone, they, they could send it back to you. Um, but the, the capabilities were, you know, somewhat limited and, and even, you um, you know, the, the Bitcoin network has recently just had some major upgrades, um, but even even still recently, I mean, there's been limitations around what Bitcoin can do from a value transfer standpoint. 
And then if you kind of go forward um, sort of five or six years, you know, to sort of the invention of smart contract platforms like Ethereum, you know, now we have ways to program in, you know, the conditional transfer of value um, that makes, you know, the transfer a lot more creative. You know, I could say I will send you, you know, Ether if it's if it's raining, you know, and pull from a weather index. I can say I will send you Ether if you send me DAI or, you know, wrapped BTC or a variety of other digital assets. But what we've seen in terms of this kind of first evolution of DeFi is what are known as decentralized exchanges. Um, so, you know, the, uh, you know, Coinbase, Gemini, others, those are what are known as centralized exchanges. You know, they, they take custody of customer funds, they're matching trades, um, you know, clients are able to, you know, buy and sell that, but that exists sort of on their platform. Um, and, you know, and, and these companies kind of control that exchange of value. Uh, decentralized exchanges, those happen all on a blockchain and those are governed by smart contracts. So you can show up to a site like Uniswap today and make a trade and there's no central counterparty. If I'm looking to you know, sell ETH and Dan is looking to buy ETH, we link up our wallets, we execute a, um, you know, we basically, you know, authorize um, uh, this agreement to enter into the smart contract and that value transfers programmatically. So there's no, you know, there, there's no sort of person or institution that's sitting in the middle of that trade. And that's pretty phenomenal, right? That you don't need a central clearing party to exchange value and you're doing that on a peer to peer basis. Mm. It also makes it really complicated in terms of like who's regulating that, you know, who's who's responsible for one, ensuring that like the smart contract is written appropriately, that there are no security flaws, um, you know, you, Today, you don't need any KYC AML, so you can go and exchange value and, and not know who your counterparty is. Um, so so it's, it's, it's very complicated. It's, um, it, and then the, the sort of other applications, some that exist and some don't, that are, is using this technology to do other, other things that we've seen in finance. You know, so that could be writing an insurance policy on the blockchain you know, that settler, settles to a weather-linked index. And so now we have like a cap bond market that it can exist on the blockchain without needing an insurance company or any regulator overseeing that. Um, you know, we, we, lending has become um, uh, you know, a, a major activity through smart contract platforms. Um, again, it's, you know, you're talking about technology that can really discern Mediate traditional players, but at the same time, you know, we have to think about ensuring that there are appropriate consumer protections because there are some of the same concerns that you have um, with, you know, with traditional financial activities. And now there's this whole new set of concerns that you have um, around using this technology. Um, and that and that can even just be from like the technology not functioning well. We've seen major hacks in um, decentralized markets uh, where people have you know just lose all of their funds. Um, that doesn't happen when you show up to JP Morgan to 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 make a trade. So it's um uh, it's you know it, again it, it, it's really really cool and we're right on the frontier of, of what DeFi is. Um, but you know this this really true like permission decentralized financial you know financial technology. Um, is the, 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 the applications are really endless, but also like the, the kind of issues that come with it are, are kind of feel endless at this point um, because, because they're so new. Dan, I'm, I'm wondering, I, and I recognize Robinhood is, is not, has got sort of limited uh, on, on the crypto space, but given what Sarah has been talking about, and we've been talking about the regulatory side, but in a decentralized world, I'm curious what your, your views are, it doesn't have to be your official views here, but what sort of responsibilities would retail companies have? It, it doesn't have to be Robinhood, but in terms of people who are providing access to these types of investments, you know, uh, what are the responsibilities they have if there's sort of no central regulator? Yeah, I mean, and again, it goes to this distinction, I think, that I, that I called out earlier between sort of traditionally regulated entities like Robinhood as a broker dealer providing this as an ancillary service and an affiliate versus the fully unregulated world right the the folks who are very studiously avoiding or they thought they were avoiding at least any trigger um you know listing a coin that will become a security right um I, I tell folks you know once something is deemed a security it's like that hot potato game you played as a kid right the the security is the hot potato and everyone wants to kind of throw it to the next person because if you hold the hot potato, then all of the registration requirements and other regulatory requirements around securities 
Sorry, someone set off their car alarm outside my window here. Uh, all of those trigger, right? So uh, one day I'm just an innocent person standing there with my hot potato. Next, next minute, I'm a broker dealer because I'm offering to buy or sell that security. I'm an ATS because I provide a market or an exchange, God forbid, right? If, if my blockchain allows for clearance and settlement, kind of like what Paxos is doing, then I'm a clearing agency that requires registration and on and on, transfer agent, potentially investment advisor and all the other registration categories that come with it. And that's just, that's an impossible situation right now. And so folks are trying to avoid, you know, buying and selling or offering these securities to customers because they don't want to trigger all these requirements. They don't want rescission rights. They don't want all these other parade of horribles to associate. And so the folks who are very careful about it, you know, end up as, as at Robinhood with a very limited offering. You know, folks who are less careful are adding coins, you know, hand over fist and, and, mm -hmm. and running that risk. Um, I, regardless, I mean, just as a corporate player, if you're a good corporate player in this space, you're going to provide some protections to your customers, whether you're regulated or not, right? Because at the end of the day, the customer can choose to walk, right? It's, a, it's the Wall Street walk. I guess this is the crypto walk. They can move to a platform that has more transparency, reliability, it's safer. Um, but that's, that's the private market working now. And, um, you know, I don't think there's, you know, compelling or, or really vibrant disclosure about those sorts of protections that that customers find important. So um, it's it's a bit of a free-for-all, um, unfortunately. And and I didn't get the chance, and I'm, I'm like uh, salivating uh, at the, to, to talk about the, the new regulator question. I know that, uh, you know, Jaime jumped in. Absolutely yep. not. You know, one of the stupidest <laughs> ideas I've heard in this space in a long time. Um, and it just, it just doesn't make sense. So folks who've been in this world for a long time know, well, first of all, uh, you know, Jaime knows how much I'd like to pick on Dodd-Frank. So Dodd-Frank cites all these reasons uh, that the financial uh, crisis was caused, uh, not not failed uh, uh, federal housing policy, which was the real reason, or, or loose money, but all these other things. And one of the things was sort of redundancy and regulation and too many agencies, the alphabet soup of, of Washington. So Dodd-Frank set out to, to limit the number of agencies and provide clearer jurisdictions. So they got rid of one agency and added three. So we ended up uh, net two plus after Dodd-Frank and with even more confusion about uh, jurisdiction. So the idea of adding a new regulator is just plain silly. Um, I think you, you obviously would need legislation. And then I sit there and think, well, gee, I think of the poor congressional staffers drafting out legislation that says, Here's this new regulator. It will regulate things that are commodities and securities at some point, but the SEC and the CFTC will have no jurisdiction over those products. It'll be just this new regulator. I mean, it just, it makes no sense. So, you know, let's, let's get serious about this. And what needs to happen is hard work needs to be done at the SEC and CFTC with, I would say, and Jaime will like this appropriate input from FINRA because they're so key to all of this, uh, to create a regime with existing authority like I said, that's light touch enough that recognizes the benefits of the technology, right? Sort of the, the, the cryptography, everything that comes with the blockchain, the auditability of the blockchain is a regulator's dream. It's built into the system. It's how things work. So let's leverage that. Uh, it's doable. You can use it with exemptive authority that the regulators have now. You can use it with their rulemaking authority. That's the best path there. So sorry, I had to, I had to jump in on that one. It's just too juicy. Uh, Jaime, did you want to uh, add on to that or, or respond no, I think at all? No, Dan okay. is, a, is a great vantage point now because he's no longer a regulator, so he can <laughs> he can apply all that. And and Jaime knows me. I'm not like a yeah. jurisdiction builder. When I was at the SEC, yeah. I thought we should merge with the CFTC. I still yeah. think they should. It's silly. So I see Sarah smiling because she called that silliness out earlier. The fact that Dodd Frank didn't do that when it set out to clean up the alphabet soup is like laugh out loud material. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be sitting around trying to figure out how to grow my jurisdiction at the SEC. The jurisdiction is real. And some of these, some of these instruments will be security, some won't. And you have to kind of take into account, you know, entities in a regulatory framework that allows firms, uh, companies, enterprises, individuals to be in a market where sometimes it's a security, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's a commodity, sometimes it's not, right? And not worry that there's going to be some gotcha uh, that comes after you post facto. 
Uh, so given that, let me try and combine uh, a couple questions here out of the Q&A. Uh, Joseph Canepa was, was talking about when Sarah, when you're talking about public infrastructure, does it entail the blockchain turning into the future internet? platform, right? But I also think w w Dan Trosh has asked, what happens to tradi traditional banks that don't adapt and what does adapting look like, right? Because if you were talking about, should we be building our own infrastructure? Should we be using public infrastructure? What does it look like for banks to adapt? And given what Dan and Jaime were talking about, uh, I guess more Dan, um, what are the concerns there for banks in terms of this? Yeah, I think from uh, sort of thinking about these questions and, and I'll sort of reiterate that these points are very much so my own. Um, but yes, I think we are going into a new era of the internet that is gonna look and feel materially different than what we've been used to. And I think that if we build this the right way, it's going to be so much better you know, from a user standpoint. And so um, a, lot of, a lot of different industries are trying to sort of co-op the term Web3. Um, it's definitely one that I wanna co-op as, um, uh, as, as a blockchain person. Um, but really, you know, what, what Web3 from a crypto standpoint refers to as, you know, internet, an internet that has native um, banking rails sort of embedded, sort of embedded into the internet itself. And this is kind of how the internet was supposed to evolve. You know, so when you hear people, you know, when you hear Mark Andreessen talking about Netscape in the 90s, you know, and the fact that like that we, we should have really already have this functionality um, and we did it, you know, kind of the internet 1.0 and even 2.0 has had sort of banking and payment rails laid on top of it from the e-commerce standpoint, you haven't had value run through it. And, and now with this new, these new capabilities, you're going to entirely re-architect the economics of the internet. And so we're no longer going to be sort of the products ourselves, like we're going to be users and we're going to be able to control um, control things like sort of privacy, um, be paid for you know, consuming advertisements, being able to be tipped for our content, being able to tip others. Um, it's going to be a you know, it's going to be a really interesting dynamic economy that's going to empower the individual. And, I, and, I, and I'm really, really excited to see where that goes. Um, with respect to sort of where do banks fall, you know, and do they need to adopt this technology? Yes, absolutely. And I think the biggest mistake I've seen with banks, you know, is talk about, you know, blockchain is really just like a kind of a new, like a next generation of techn technology or another tech choice, because it's not... It, it's not just that blockchain enables, you know, banks to digitize value. Like you don't need a blockchain to do that. Like the value is already digitized at the central banking level, at the commercial banking level, um, at apps like Robinhood and SoFi and PayPal and others. You know, what blockchain has redone is really, you know, again, re-architected how we think about value. And, um, and, and so th th this is really a, you know, this is really a new technology unto itself. Um, and I think that traditional institutions really need to, you know, they don't have to embrace every part of it, but they really have to think about, you know, wh where is this going to be disruptive for our business and where, where can we best add value to this ecosystem? Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that institutions that are not, not just paying attention, but really building towards this future and being thoughtful about where they're going to fit are, 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 are going to fall behind. Yeah. And if I could just jump in there, I really think we're very much in the early innings of this thing. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, probably the, the beginning of the first inning, really. Um, you know, you, you've gone from um, just a few years ago where, where many financial institutions or, or larger financial institutions were saying, you know, kind of digital assets are fool's gold to uh, coming, coming around and to seeing, you know, wanting to serve clients who want to have exposure in this space um, and to, you know, having a presence uh, uh, whatever in this space as well. And you've gone from, you know, kind of um, the, the private networks and public networks to um, um, various forms that will let you kind of uh, pull, da pull digital assets from one, uh, basically interoperability, they'll let you pull assets from one to another. Um, you have new types of net, uh, new types of blockchain networks like uh, Solana, they're being brought, in, or being brought out that has the throughput that something maybe like the Ethereum blockchain network potentially wouldn't have uh, that allows you to kind of do um, a very large number of transactions within a very small amount of time, similar to the throughput that you may have like in a, in a NASDAQ or a Visa. Um, so you have all these various changes that are going on all at the same time. Um, and I think it's undetermined where all that's going to progress and, and what that ultimately is going to look like. 
Um, but I do think that it's something that um, most financial institutions now, they're at least keeping an eye on, if not actively uh, looking to see, is there a way that we can get involved in a way that's keeping with kind of the best interests of their clients, as well as, as the regulatory requirements that exist out there. I would follow on to that, though, that, that the innovation is exponentially speeding up. And so it's, you know, the, I, I think what we're, I think what we're going to see is, yeah, yes, we're still very much so in early innings of this technology and, and so much so that we don't even quite know what it's going to look like, but the, the pace of innovation is accelerating. And because you have a global network in which anyone can participate in it, um, you know, the, the innovation is, you know, by definition exponential. Um, so I think that it's yeah, as a regulator where, trying to keep up, I'll definitely agree with that. <laughs> I mean, it's almost, it's, it's almost impossible. Possible. I mean, we're talking about you know ICO fraud from a couple of years ago, and then you know, and then you see kind of what happened in terms of the um, the crypto punk being you know the wash trading with the crypto punk for half a billion dollars a couple of weeks ago, and that's a problem that literally could not have existed like only a couple of years ago. And so it's you know it, 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 it's it's tough for regulators, um, but but it's also again it's just but from a technology standpoint, like from the seat that I get to have, it's unbelievably exciting because again, every year brings sort of more and more innovation. Um, so, you know, I think that it's the, the, the let's sit back, wait and see what happens approach is like that, the, the, that's not for the winners. Like, like that, that people, people who do that are going to be um, people or institutions who do that are going to be significantly disadvantaged because by the time they kind of get, you know, get to a place that they're comfortable, like it, this technology is already going to look like something else. And I think we have like a minute left. So Dan, I'm going to give you the, the last word. Maybe you can tie this all, all together because, right, uh, Sarah has just talked about the pace of innovation. Uh, and we started with regulation, right? Um, how fast do we need to do a new regulatory structure to allow traditional companies, traditional finance companies to, to innovate uh, so that they are, you know, places like Robinhood are traditional broker dealers? Um, yeah, yeah we, need, we needed it probably a couple of years ago. Um, so I think, you know, Sarah's right. I mean, and Jaime's right. The pace is just incredible. Um, I think what we need is, you know, not, not a sandbox. I always hate when you say sandbox. Like, I don't even know what that means anymore. It, it sounded like a great idea five years ago. It didn't really get us anything here in the U.S. at least. I know there's some, you know, and, and, and a Jaime, I, I, I don't want to offend FINRA when I say that, but I, you know, you're so dependent on what the SEC is doing in that regard um, that it, it's hard for you to have a you know fully vibrant sandbox. I think what we need is just a process. And we've heard Chair Gensler at the SEC say, come in and talk to us. I know the staff and FinHub at the SEC is very receptive to talking. We just need some, we need some guardrails, some guidelines, right? Of just like, you know, uh, good firms, you know, uh, regulatory uh, compliant firms, firms who operate in the trad traditional world who are, are used to this intense regulatory climate so can come in you know, seek the right relief to do this in a very safe way for, for retail investors in particular. Um, you know, we need that. We need some sort of, of uh, bat signal up in the clouds to draw folks in. And, and we're getting a little bit of it. You know, I just think we need, we need something a little bit more clear and uh, we need it ASAP. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, thank you, Dan and Jaime and Sarah. Uh, we could go on for a long time here. There's some really great questions and that I apologize for not getting to all of them, but I really appreciate uh, your time and your expertise. Um, thank you all so much. This was fantastic.